In the early morning hours of November 7, 2018, a Boeing 747 overran the runway at Halifax, Canada. In this video, we're going to find out what led to this accident and how misleading briefing documents caused the pilots of this Queen of the Sky to wreck their aircraft. This video is sponsored by nobody. If you'd like to change that, check out my Patreon page in the description or get a channel membership by clicking join below. I offer many cool benefits for as little as $3 a month. Now let's get on with the video. Welcome to Airspace. On November 6, 2018, the pilots of a Skylease Boeing 747 freighter were getting ready for their flight from Chicago to Anchorage, Alaska, with a quick stop to pick up cargo at Halifax. But the day didn't start well for the pilots in Chicago. The weather forecast indicated a very low cloud ceiling and bad visibility at Halifax. So bad, in fact, that a landing would not have been possible there. Hence, the captain and Skylease's operations department decided to delay the flight by about 13 hours to the very early morning of November 7th. When the pilots finally arrived at the aircraft, they decided to pick up a lot of fuel to avoid having to refuel at Halifax. In addition, this first flight would be a positioning flight, meaning that the aircraft would not be carrying any cargo. At this point, the crew had also considered their briefing documents, which contained a heap of information on the weather, all kinds of airways and airports, and the technical status of their aircraft. To obtain more information about the airport's use on this flight, the crew consulted the so-called NOTAM. Until recently, NOTAM was an acronym for Notice to Airmen, but the FAA recently changed it to Notice to Air Missions to be more inclusive. No, I'm not kidding. Unfortunately for the crew, the NOTAM was quite long that night. 98 separate notices concerned that flight. When the pilots decoded the cryptic messages, they found that one runway was closed due to construction at Halifax, runway 23 to be precise. Halifax has two runways, a long runway 23 and a shorter runway 14. Due to the closure of runway 23, the crew now had to plan a landing on runway 14. Since the runway is only 2,350 meters or 7,700 feet long, this presented the pilots of the Boeing 747 with quite some challenge. Due to the large amount of fuel, their plane was pretty heavy. Not exceedingly so, because they didn't carry any cargo, but still quite heavy for a landing on a runway this short. To see whether they could land on runway 14, the pilots made a landing performance calculation with the weight and presumed weather at the time of their arrival. They discovered that they would be able to make a successful landing and stop on the runway well before the end. After this calculation was finished, nothing stood in the way of the flight and after another hour of delay due to paperwork issues, the flight finally departed Chicago. One and a half hours later, the first officer obtained the latest weather and airport information for the captain. This report indicated conditions as the pilots had expected. A wet runway, a slight crosswind exactly from the right and a landing on runway 14. With this information, the captain completed his approach briefing. In it, he stated that he would use the auto brake function of the 747 on a rather high setting to bring the massive airliner to a halt as quickly as possible. And so, the crew commenced their approach. Luckily for them, there weren't many other planes that night and air traffic control cleared them for a direct approach without any delays. Soon, the 747 was nicely established on the instrument landing system's beams. But when they were just over a minute away from the runway, the captain noticed that the wind had grown stronger than indicated in the forecast. Additionally, it seemed that a slight tailwind component had developed, now pushing the aircraft towards the runway faster than anticipated. Some apprehension could be heard in the captain's voice, but still he continued the approach. A minute later, he slammed the 747 down rather hard at the so-called crab angle. This means that the aircraft was not perfectly aligned with the runway center line. Immediately, the captain pulled back the thrust levers and soon thereafter, he started braking by applying the brake pedals of the aircraft. But it seemed that the aircraft just didn't want to stop. It continued to barrel down the short runway. When it came close to the end, the captain applied full brakes, but it was too late. The Boeing 747 rushed past the runway end at a speed of 77 knots, that's about 90 miles per hour or 140 kilometers per hour. It crashed through the localizer antenna array and slid down an embankment. In the process, the landing gear collapsed almost entirely and two engines were ripped off the aircraft. It finally came to a halt just short of a public road. Immediately, the crew and their sole passenger, a captain who was off duty, started to evacuate the aircraft. They were all pretty shaken up and were taken to a nearby hospital. Now, let's find out what happened here. 
When investigators interviewed the crew, they were particularly interested in the reasons why the crew believed that runway 23, the longer one, was unavailable. In fact, the decision to land on the short runway 14 was unnecessary. Runway 23 was indeed under construction, but only partially. Only the first few hundred meters of it were closed, and the runway would have been perfectly safe to use. It would still have provided a much greater length than runway 14. Why did the crew not realize this? When presented with this question, the crew testified that there were no less than 98 NOTAMs that night, of which 37 concerned Halifax. Of these 37, a whopping 22 related to construction work on runway 23. And of these, some were cross-referenced, meaning one would have to find and check the old NOTAM first, then see if one can find the new NOTAM and the difference of the two. It's like Where's Waldo for pilots. It's a pretty jumbled mess of letters, and it surely didn't help that they were in no particular order, or that the abbreviations for not usable and not authorized were used. Unfortunately, this crew is in good company. NOTAMs are extremely annoying and hard to read. The most famous incident featuring another instance of NOTAMs that were misunderstood or missed is the case of an Air Canada Airbus A320 that had overlooked the fact that the runway was closed in San Francisco. It subsequently attempted to land on a taxiway that was full of waiting airliners. I have a video on that as well if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the description. In a hearing with the National Transportation Safety Board, the chairman of the board stated, quote, That's what NOTAMs are, they're just a pile of garbage that no one pays any attention to. End quote. The problem has been recognized, but to date, there is no solution to provide better NOTAMs to pilots. Some airlines offer flight briefing applications to filter and highlight certain words, but currently that's about as good as it gets. I hope there will be more improvement in the future. So this was the long explanation why the crew chose to land on a short runway when they could have landed on a longer one. But why were they unable to stop? Didn't they calculate whether they could stop beforehand? Yes, they did. Unfortunately, they miscalculated the required landing distance because they used the wrong tables for their calculations. You see, landing distance calculation is somewhat complicated. There are tables for so-called unfactored landing distance and there are tables that consider a factored landing distance, which uses a more realistic landing scenario and implements some safety margins. By using the unfactored one, the crew determined that they would be able to stop on the runway with 1700 feet or 500 meters to spare. The thing is, this table assumes a hard touchdown close to the beginning of the runway, correct, prompt and hard brake application and other conditions that are rarely perfect in real life. Had the crew used the factor table, they would have realized that the runway would have been at least 1000 feet or 300 meters too short for their landing. But their lapses didn't end there. While the unfactored landing distance table assumes a theoretical perfect landing, the landing the captain made that night was far from perfect. Several factors increased the landing distance substantially. The crew had miscalculated their approach speed too, and they intended to fly faster than they were required to do. Additionally, the captain didn't maintain the speed nicely, which resulted in further excess of energy and a substantial increase in landing distance. Next, the tailwind accelerated the aircraft even more. And lastly, the captain came in slightly too high. The plane was doomed the moment it crossed the runway threshold, before the wheels even touched the ground. When they did, the touchdown wasn't nice. The captain slammed the plane down rather hard and at an angle to the runway. This resulted in engine 1 and 2 making contact with the runway. Still, the engines continued to function normally. Due to the crosswind and the crab angle, the aircraft now drifted quickly towards the runway edge, which required a lot of effort of the captain and the first officer to return the plane to the center line. Meanwhile, for unknown reasons, the captain had not brought all thrust levers to the idle position. Engine 1 continued to produce slight but noticeable forward thrust, while the other engines started producing reverse thrust. This further aggravated the tendency of the aircraft to drift towards the runway edge. But what's a lot more important is the fact that with one engine not at idle, the ground spoilers on top of the wings did not deploy automatically. Without these, the wings continued to produce lift on the ground, reducing the efficiency of the brakes greatly. Also, this fact led to the deactivation of the auto brake system, which was initially not recognized by the crew. You see, this accident, like so many others, is a combination of many factors. Last but not least, the board noted that the accident happened at around 5 in the morning and all pilots had insufficient sleep periods in the last 24 hours, so fatigue was probably a factor here as well. So let me summarize all this for you, I know it was a lot. 
First, the crew failed to realize that a longer runway would have been available for them because the no-time format is terrible. Second, they used wrong tables and the wrong technique to determine their landing distance and approach speed. I'm somewhat astonished that Skylys didn't provide them with a modern performance calculation application. These are a lot more foolproof and easier to use than paper tables. And finally, the crew would have been unable to stop on the runway, even in perfect conditions. The bad landing by the captain, in connection with the mishandling of the thrust levers, just sealed their fate and led to a definitive runway overrun. The aircraft itself was pretty obviously damaged beyond repair and was written off. An estimated 24 tons of fuel leaked into the soil below, which had to be treated with over a quarter million liters of water, which then needed to be treated and disposed of. Additionally, just under 5,000 tons of soil were removed from the site and disposed of. Well, this was the unfortunate story of the Skylys Boeing 747 that overran the runway at Halifax. I hope you liked the story. If you did, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for many more interesting aviation videos. See you in the next one.